Hello. Today we are going to be talking about India and its relationship with the British Empire in the period 1750 to 1860 CE. As always, it's important to remember that nothing in world history is happening in a vacuum. And so we're going to pick up this period by looking at the Seven Years' War, which we've studied before. It really is the first First World War because it's essentially a giant war between Britain and France that has fought on five different continents. So in India, we have the French and East India Company operated in a very similar way to the English East India Company, right? It's a charter company, so they function as effectively as a government in the area that they control, and then they have exclusive trading privileges, right? Um, the French in the in the 1700s they were a lot more uh, dominant in in southern India than in northern India. There was already sort of a, a a break there where the British had more influence in northern India, and at this period the French had more influence in uh, southern India. Uh, but as the French and the British are fighting each other in North America and in West Africa and in Europe. Uh, they're also fighting each other in Bengal uh, and in southern India. Uh, the British tended to not use very many of their own troops. They had British troops train a much larger Indian army, so they, they helped organize Indian armies and they made sure that the army was getting paid on a regular basis and had the appropriate uh, equipment. On the other hand, the French didn't do that. They relied exclusively on Indian armies, and that was a pretty bad strategy for them uh, because of the relative lack of organization. In addition to the French, the Brits were also uh, fighting against some of the native Indian rulers, and one of those places was Bengal. Uh, you can see Bengal on the map there. It's sort of in the eastern area of India. Uh, and part of the dynamic is that whereas in the earlier period, the British were very uh, interested in Indian culture and deferential towards it, by this period, the British East India Company uh, is not that way anymore. Basically, they're no longer... Um, kissing the butts of the local Indian rulers. We're starting to see some of that, uh, the arrogance that's kind of embedded in the British Empire. Uh, the local ruler, who's known as a Nawab, so that's a term, not a name, the Nawab of Bengal attacked the city of Calcutta. It's one of the uh, largest cities in India today, and it was one of the cities that was originally founded by the British East India Company. So the Nawab of Bengal rolls into Calcutta, drives the British out, uh, massacres a bunch of them, and that was probably a bad play because the British came back the following year, uh, defeated the Nawab's army, and along the same, at the same time, they also drove the French out of those coastal areas of eastern India. Uh, part of the reason why the British were successful is because of collaboration with local Indians and Indian interests. Now, this isn't political uh, at this point, it's economic. So, you know, the Brits tended to uh, pay the bills uh, in a way that sometimes the local rulers in India did not. Uh, and so Indian bankers, local Indian bankers, appreciated the British and were more open to British rule than to local Indian rule, uh, just because of the stability. So once the British successfully conquer Bengal, they replace the previous Nawab and put a Nawab on the throne of Bengal that will essentially do whatever the British want him to do. Uh, one of the things that also worked out for the British is that in the Nawab's army, in the, in the Bengali army, you had all these different rival groups. 
and the British were able to take advantage of those rivalries, and in fact, they, they even paid off some of the groups within the Bengali army to not fight the British. Now, prior to this period, the, the standard operating procedure for the British Empire was to uh, become influential economic partners. They were not interested in direct conquest. They didn't, have, they didn't have any interest whatsoever in ruling over India directly. And so conquering all of Bengal is a remarkable change in policy, but that policy was being driven by the East India Company, not the British government. And so that becomes a problem for the British government because once the company is in charge of Bengal, they're plundering the country, they're extorting people, they're setting up a protection racket. Uh, a, protect, a protection racket is one of those things where if you own a store and I walk into your store and I say, hey, give me 50 bucks a week and I'll make sure that nobody messes around with your store, that's a protection racket because what I'm implying there is if you don't give me the 50 bucks, I'm going to be the one that's going to mess around with your store. Right? So all of those practices led the East India Company to be pretty severely criticized at home in the British press. And that ultimately forces Parliament to act. And they pass something called the India Act, which creates a governmental organization called the Board of Control that supervises the British East India Company. It had run as a charter company. It was effectively independent. Uh, and the British government in 1784 realizes, okay, that's not going to work anymore. We can't really trust these guys. Uh, the Board of Control says no more territory in India will come under direct control of the, of the company, right? They really want to shift back to that previous practice of being influential, but not actually having to run the country. Um, and in 1785, they sent Lord Cornwallis, uh, he the person who uh, lost the 13 colonies in North America at the Battle of Yorktown, uh, he gets a new job. He gets to go to India. So that's kind of cool. You lose 13 colonies and you get a promotion. So they send him to India to try to reform the administration of the East India Company. So he's, no, he's not a part of the company. He's a British government official who's trying to lock down uh, the, the East India Company to make sure that it doesn't continue to expand its influence and give the British more responsibility in India. Uh, he tried to deal with corruption. It was only semi-successful in that regard. Uh, but he did successfully set up a new administrative code and a new judicial system for all of the areas of India that were controlled by the British. So once again, during this period, the British were wholly disinterested in direct rule of India. They much, much preferred to... Uh, heavily influence the various princes and the various states in India, the independent countries, uh, rather than direct rule beyond the territory that they had already conquered, such as Bengal. Uh, for the most part, the British rule was actually welcomed, or at least people were very indifferent uh, towards the, or unaware of British rule. So the elites preferred British rule because of the stability that the British uh, brought to the areas that were under their control. Uh, the elites were no longer beholden to the whims of the local rulership, right? That is one thing that the British do very well is stabilize areas during this period. And they definitely had their problems as well, as we'll see. Uh, the Indian middle class also were satisfied with British rule because increased trading opportunities, a uh, more stable banking system than had existed prior to the arrival of the British. And then, of course, the largest group of people by far in India would be the peasantry. And the peasantry, you know, they might not even have been completely aware of the existence of the British because 
the local officials were all still Indians, and particularly the zamindars. We talked about the zamindars when we were looking at India in a previous period. They're the tax collectors. So the only thing the British did is replace the the highest level of the hierarchy. So if you're an Indian peasant, the same zamindar that was coming to your town to collect taxes before the British showed up is going to be the same person after the British showed up. The only difference being that the taxes are not going to a Nawab or you know some other Indian prince. Uh, they're going to the British East India Company. Uh, unfortunately, though, the zamindars would take your land if you couldn't pay the taxes, and that allowed the East India Companies to start to build large plantations. Once you've taken their land, you aggregate it, and now instead of having free peasants who are farming their own land, now you have tenant farmers or plantation workers that are working large, uh, large plantations of, of you know lots of different things. But cotton was a big one, and we'll see that that uh, is significant with respect to uh, America during this period. For the most part, the British did not interfere with Indian customs. They did suppress banditry because that was a huge problem, but that was a welcome change. Uh, they also abolished slavery in the areas that they had control over, and they suppressed a custom known as sati, which I believe we also spoke about in a, a, a previous lecture, which is the ritual suicide of a woman after her husband's death. So the, you can see in the image there, they've established a funeral pyre. Uh, the, the husband's body is laying on top of it, and the woman is meant to throw herself on the pyre and uh, burn to death upon the death of her husband. Um, not really practiced anymore. The British were the ones that began to uh, suppress that practice. And another thing that the British did is made, made sure that Christian mi missionaries didn't get out of control. Uh, we saw that a little bit when the Portuguese showed up in India, and that was problematic. And so the British made sure that the only thing Christian missionaries could do would be set up schools. Uh, they were not allowed to go out into the countryside and, and, and you know preach the word of Jesus to local Indians. Now, there's no way that the British would be effective at conquering India without help from local Indians. Uh, most Indians realized that the British were really the only ones capable of maintaining order and allowing for trade across all of the various principalities. They understood uh, after, you know, decades of misrule after the end of the Mughal Empire that it was, you know, the Brits were the one that were going to make their economic prosperity uh, a little bit better. Uh, you, you have the local Indian rulers are still very corrupt and there is a lot of really oppressive taxation. These are in the areas that are not under the control of the British East India Company. Um, but that just drove more people into the areas that were under the control of the British. Because if you live in an area with oppressive taxation and no order and no safety and no justice, well, that makes those areas that were under the control of the British look uh, much more appealing. And the East India Company would employ Indians, but, but not for any high-ranking positions. They really only had the more, you know, low-level or menial jobs within the East India Company. We saw during the Seven Years' War the way in which the decades-long struggle between the British and the French uh, impacted India in the 1750s and 1760s. Well, we see the same thing happen during the De Napoleonic Wars. Uh, the Brits changed that long-held practice of not wanting to directly rule the, the states of India. But, you know, they, they changed because of Napoleon. They wanted to make sure that Napoleon wasn't able to expand uh, his control in India. India was just too valuable to let the French... Uh, take away. And so they 
started to conquer some of the states in southern India that were a little bit more open to the French than they were to the British. Uh, they also expanded inward from Bengal and took over the whole, it's called the Gangetic Plain, it's the whole lowland area around the River Ganges. So in the map, it's the big chunk of purple in the northern part of India. That's the Gangetic Plain going down into Bengal, which they already controlled. There are a few other uh, independent states that the British took over, uh, including the tiny last remnants of the Mughal Empire. We know that the Mughal Empire effectively ceased to exist almost a hundred years before this period, but you do still have that tiny little bit around Delhi uh, that was technically the Mughal Empire. Uh, the British also took over Ceylon, which is the modern day uh, independent country of Sri Lanka took it over from the Dutch uh, because the Netherlands had been conquered by Napoleon. And so any place that had been under the rule of a country which was conquered by Napoleon, you see the British swoop in and try to take control of that. Uh, and then once they have control of Ceylon, they start planting coffee and tea because those are both very lucrative uh, exports. So by the mid 19th century, British arrogance was at its height and they decided that uh, India needed to be quote unquote civilized. Now that's setting aside the fact that Indian civilization is about 2000 years older than British civilization, but there's your arrogance. Uh, so in the earlier period, we see a lot of Brits are very uh, respectful of Indian culture and Indian customs and are are really interested in learning more and becoming you know more appreciative of Indian culture but by this period that's completely changed the Brits consider their culture to be superior to all other cultures that has a, a ring of you know America in recent decades uh, but they start forcing Indians in the areas that they control to uh, conform to British standards of clothing and, you know, a British style education. Uh, the English language, English script replaced Sanskrit as the, the written language. Of course, there were hundreds of different languages, perhaps thousands of different languages across India, but but at least in northern India for most part, Sanskrit is the is the actual script that was used. Well English replaces that. And you have British style schools replacing traditional Indian curriculum, at least for middle and upper class uh, uh, Indians. So part of what they're doing is they're training Indians to work within the administration of the British Empire so that they don't have to send as many Britons to India. They're also teaching science and math, which, you know, were kind of developed in, or science at least, sort of developed in, in Western Europe. Uh, mathematics a little bit spread across the, the Islamic world as well. But they're also teaching European history and literature, which seems sort of odd, uh, for, you know, a country with a rich literary tradition uh, of its own. Now, upper class Indians would still also receive a traditional Indian education, but, but the lower classes were, did not have that available to them. Um, and eventually, also, you have a lot of upper class Indians who travel to Britain to go to British universities, sometimes performing even better than than the British students themselves. Uh, one backlash of this though, is that it stimulated what's known as the Hindu Renaissance. So sometimes what you'll see is, if my culture comes into your country and starts suppressing your culture and replacing it with mine, uh, suddenly sometimes people get a lot more interested in their own native culture. And we see this in a lot of places during the period of colonization. Now, the East India Company had had a monopoly on trade coming out of India for 230 years. Uh, but due to mismanagement in the early to mid 19th century, the East India Company lost its monopoly. And that sort of is the beginning of the end of the East India Company. India had had a native cotton production production 
uh, operation for centuries, if not millennia. But it was all hand-woven. And the Industrial Revolution brings a lot of changes. Now, they're not building factories in India. They're building factories in England. But what they end up doing is they start flooding the Indian market with cheap mass-produced cotton, right? So the British Empire is getting cotton from various places in the empire or from trading partners such as the southern United States. Uh, and then they mass-produce this cotton and they ship it to India and they can sell it because it costs so much less than the cotton that is woven by hand all across India. Now, of course, what that does is that puts millions of weavers out of work across India, which is problematic. Uh, if you destroy an industry, and we see this in America, you, if you destroy an industry, but you don't have another uh, you know, form of, of work for the people who lose their jobs, uh, that can create a lot of, of negative sentiment towards you. Now, you know, as with everything with the British Empire in India, there's some bad, usually a, kind of a lot of bad, but there's also some good. And, you know, during the middle part of the 19th century, the British built tons of infrastructure. They built railroads all across India. They built telegraph lines all across India. They established a postal system. So what we see is it's really the British that start pulling India together into something that is a bit more unified. Now, we know that there have been various empires across the northern part of India, uh, you know, the Mughal Empire being one example that we've studied in this course, but no one had ever completely unified the Indian subcontinent. And what we see happening now is the beginnings of that. Now, they, of course, use the railroads to haul uh, agricultural products and, you know, raw materials, mining, stuff like that, to the cities to then transport to various parts of the empire. Uh, and then one other thing that the British did is they, they implemented a, a law, a code of law that would cross all of India, you know, at least any part of India that was controlled by the British at that point. And they used Indian judges. So you now have essentially a uniform legal system across all of India or the parts of India that the Brits control, although we're going to see how much more of India the British end up controlling uh, in a moment. In the mid-19th century, we see a dramatic shift in the way that Britain looks at areas that were under its control, and they become much more interested in expansion, right, which is a big change from what we saw in, in the 18th century. Uh, the in East India Company moves into other parts of India and takes direct political control over several of the states. And then you see that the prince or the Maharaja or whomever it is that is, is the monarch in charge of that state, they're kind of uh, sidelined and some provinces that were uh, promised that they would never be controlled directly by the British or by the East India Company. Well, we see a betrayal of those promises. Uh, one area that was still independent was a region in uh, western India called Punjab. Uh, Punjab was in was a region that was dominated by a group of people known as Sikhs. Uh, the Sikhs are both a religious and an ethnic and a linguistic uh, group, right? So they're they're not Hindus, uh, they're not Muslims. It's a different religion. And in the 1840s, Punjab was still independent, uh, but by this period, the British were now very interested in ruling directly over much, if not all, of India. And so they took advantage of some unrest that was happening. Uh, at that time, and they went into full force into Punjab and eventually defeat the Sikhs. But they were so impressed by the, the, the fighting prowess of the Sikhs that they end up offering the Sikhs opportunities to uh, join the British army and, in fact, effectively become, you know, almost like the special forces of the British army. And we see them fighting for the British right through the, the early to mid 20th century in both the First and the Second World Wars. Now, 
Afghanistan was an issue for the British. Uh, the British were concerned that the Russians might try to invade Afghanistan for the purposes of starting to perhaps try to take control of certain parts of India. Now, as we know here in the 21st century, Afghanistan is a very hard place to uh, conquer and take full control out of. We've seen three different empires, if you count America as an empire, try to conquer Afghanistan. So the British try this in the 19th century, the Russians try it in the 1970s and the 80s, and then we tried it here in the 2000s. Uh, bad mistake. Don't try to conquer Afghanistan. It's not going to happen. So after two years of being attacked by, you know, guerrilla warriors uh, in, in Afghanistan, the British pull back into India. So you can see there that the British Empire was a lot perhaps more wise than the United States of America because it only took them two years to realize, oh, this is a mistake, whereas, you know, the United States has been in Afghanistan for 18 years, right? Haven't learned our lesson yet. One of the biggest colonial challenges that the British Empire faced after the American Revolution was uh, what the British refer to as the Indian Mutiny and what is now commonly referred to as the Great Rebellion of 1857. So what happens there is that, you know, the, the arrogance of the British and the more oppressive nature of their rule uh, creates a lot of resentment across India. Um, the the Indian aristocracy, they feel threatened by the Indian bourgeoisie, right? So the city dwellers, the traders, the merchants, the bankers, uh, who were allied with the British. Uh, and the, the Indian military forces, they didn't like the fact that the British forced them to travel all over the British Empire and fight on their behalf. And so what you see is the, the Indian elite, the aristocracy, and the military start to become allies, um, especially as the, the British uh, grab more and more land. And so this leads to an uprising. Uh, there was a rumor that, unfortunately was it accurate, that rifle cartridges were being coated in pork fat. Right, so this was not. Um, this was just a part of the manufacturing process. There was no innate desire on the part of the British to insult Indian Muslims uh, and Hindus, but that happened. Uh, they were very offended. Now, and even though the practice was changed very quickly, and they switched over to you know some a different form of lubricant, that the damage was done, uh, and. When you see soldiers start to protest nonviolently, just saying, hey, this is a problem, instead of the British saying, yeah, that was a mistake, we apologize, uh, you know, that, that British arrogance kicks in. And the, instead of apologizing and changing the, the, the policy, they start dishonorably discharging uh, Indian soldiers who complain about this practice which then leads to a rebellion. So you see the soldiers, the Indian soldiers, rising up against the British, uh, and they start by killing all of their British officers. Um, and and it, it continues and it gets much worse, and eventually the Indian forces uh, massacre all of the British in the capital of Delhi. They haul out the Mughal Empire, emperor and put him back on the throne and try to establish an, an independent but unified India. Um, and, you know, the British, by the summer of 1857, they had lost a, a lot of India. They lost most of the Gangetic Plain. They've lost all of the Punjab and much of central India. So that's a big chunk of India that the British lost. Despite the successes of the mutineers, most Indian soldiers actually remained loyal to the British. 
and most Indian people stood with the British. They recognized the that their economic prosperity was due in large part to the British and the stability that the British Empire brought to much of India. And about a year after the height of the rebellion, uh, all of the territory that the the Indian mutineers had taken was taken back by the British. And the British were definitely not um, magnanimous in victory. They were very vengeful. And so the British would destroy entire villages that had been loyal to the rebels. Um, they would execute people with cannon, uh, which is pretty gnarly. Uh, they also tracked down that Mughal Empire emperor that uh, had been put back on the throne, and they killed him and murdered all of his children. So uh, there would be no more Mughal emperors. Not that they had any control for more than a century, but you know that that figurehead was still there, but no longer. Uh, However, the rebellion kind of destroyed the relationship between the Indian people uh, and the British, right? Now you, instead of having, you know, sort of a, a mutually beneficial relationship, and economically there was still some mutual benefit, at least for the merchants and the bankers, not so much for the peasants. Uh, but now you have a mutual fear and hatred. And so instead of there being, you know, collaboration, you have direct rule. So the East India Company is over and you have now what is referred to as the British Raj, the British rule, right? And now Britain is an occupying power. They have control of the entire Indian subcontinent and all of India gets formally integrated into the British Empire. And the British king or queen uh, now is not just a king or queen uh, of Britain, but is also the emperor or empress of India. So in this map, you can see what British India looked like in the year 1780, so before the really significant expansion period. So you've got Bengal, which had already been conquered, uh, and then you see those regions of coastal eastern India, which were areas that the British took away from the French during the Seven Years' War. But, you know, other than those areas, the rest of India was a, a, a collection of independent principalities. Now about 80 years later the map looks very very different. You can see that the British have full control of the subcontinent. Uh, there are direct British possessions and those are the ones you see in pink. Uh, and then you have the further acquisitions that happen between the end of the Great Rebellion and the beginning of the First World War which is 1914. And you can see there that the British took control of Burma, uh, which is now called Myanmar, and some areas uh, on, the, on the western side of the Indian subcontinent. And then you also have the what are called the dependent Indian states. So the ones that are in that light orange are technically independent, but effectively not. They don't have the ability to control any of their external affairs. And if the British are dissatisfied with anything that is happening internally in those principalities, well, then the British welcome themselves to come in and restore order, at least order from the perspective of the British. Thank you for staying all the way to the end of my video. I really appreciate it. And you're welcome to take a look at any of the other related videos on my channel.